Hello, this is Colleen Clemenson, Sandag Special Projects Director, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the first in a series of webinars to discuss a bold new vision for the San Diego region in five big moves. In these webinars, we will dive deeper into each of the five moves through a panel discussion with Sandag staff and industry leaders. Sandag staff will provide our initial thinking on the concepts and we've asked the industry experts to weigh in, share thoughts on applications for us to consider, giving their experiences in other places in the nation and globally. All along the way, we invite you to think about the questions that you have for our panelists and type them in at any time. Today, our panelists consists of transportation planner, Alex Estrella from Sandag, industry expert, Ben Summers, from McKinsey and Company, and industry expert Jonathan Hart from CDM Smith. Thank you very much to our panelists. The five big moves. The five big moves include complete corridors, the backbone of the transportation system, pulling together all aspects of the network, highways, roadways, transit, bicycle and pedestrian improvements. Transit Leap is high-speed transit that provides a compelling alternative to driving. It's fast, safe, convenient, and reliable. Mobility Hubs, the third big move, are centers of activity connected by high-speed transit and a variety of transportation alternatives. Flexible Fleets, the fourth big move, are smaller neighborhood vehicles that are available on demand, shared, electric, and autonomous. And the next operating system, which is the brain that makes the whole system work. It's these five moves together that provide the strategy for a bold new vision for the San Diego region's transportation system. We all know we can't build our way out of congestion, although population growth is continuing and congestion continues to build on our local highway system. However, we can explore ways to improve our roadways, provide compelling transportation alternatives to driving. And that's where we start with complete corridors. So Alex Australia, tell us from our Sandag team perspective, what we envision to be the key elements of a complete corridor. So what's a complete corridor? As you described previously, Colleen, complete corridors is the backbone of our region's future transportation network, and they are more than just roadways. So complete corridors looks at our future transportation network holistically, and they will include dedicated bike and pedestrian infrastructure, environmental improvements, smart and actively managed highways and local streets. So together with technology and the right infrastructure, the complete quarters will provide a balanced and seamless transportation network that will move more people and goods safely and more efficiently. So let's take a look at some of the key features under the complete quarters, like the implementation of a connected network of managed lanes, like the one that we have along the I-15 express lanes. So complete quarters will provide priority access to transit, carpool, and van pool users. So this network of managed lanes will provide a seamless transfer between freeways for carpool, van pool, and transit users, accommodate more people throughput, and help address congestion in response to, to real-time freeway conditions. Another key feature under the complete quarters includes the implementation of active demand management using real-time information from the vehicles and the infrastructure to influence how the transportation system is used and to prioritize transit and ride sharing. So let's take a look, for example, along the I-5 North Coast Corridor. As we apply demand management in the next five to 20 years, the existing freeway static signs can be converted to dynamic signs. And those signs can help and provide display of which lanes can be used by transit and ride sharing vehicles. And those same signs could also help manage speeds, warn travelers of upcoming incidents, congestion, or improve stop and go traffic. 
Now, active demand management increases the carrying capacity or volume of people that, and goods that can be moved more efficiently through a network. Now, this system could also be beneficial during emergency situations by rerouting travelers, providing dedicated lanes during evacuations. Another key feature in the complete course includes the implementation of connected and infrastructure improvements. We know that in the future, in-vehicle and wireless technology will enable widespread connected vehicle communications between the vehicles themselves and the roadway infrastructure. We also know that based on US DOT estimates, in-vehicle connected technology will be incorporated into 95% in newly manufactured or existing vehicles by 2045. So Complete Cores prepares for that future by providing high-speed communication networks and smart sensors that will enable vehicles and the roads to talk to each other, but also share data. And these improvements can help the vehicles to travel closer or in platoons, as you can see here, and they will also improve traffic flow and increase the carrying capacity of the transportation network. Now, at the local level, the connected infrastructure will include smart intersections that will allow the communication of vehicles with transit, with pedestrians and bike riders. Now these users will get alerts as they approach an intersection, which helps to reduce accidents and improve safety. Another key feature includes the implementation of transit and shared mobility multimodal infrastructure to ensure that local streets and roads have the appropriate infrastructure and technology in place to support all modes, including transit, active transportation, shared mobility service, and commercial deliveries. So the type of strategies considered will include dedicated lanes, providing signal priority treatments, and curb management strategies that would rotate the use of curb space for passenger pickup and loading zones, including for service delivery drop-off zones, and also for the use of flexible fleets. And finally, the complete quarters will also include zero emission vehicle infrastructure improvements for both plug-in electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles. So by providing more zero emission vehicles combined with fewer traffic jams and the island of the vehicles, and by providing people with more transportation options, the complete course can help reduce congestion and air pollution. Now the state of California has a goal of having 5 million ZEVs on the road by 2030. And really to support this goal, the complete cores will offer the infrastructure that include charging station and fueling stations, but finding them and locating them at the right locations. The complete cores will also look at opportunities for wireless EV charging infrastructure. And these are just some of the ideas that we're thinking about the complete cores. Okay, very good. Thank you, Alex. Uh, with that, let's move to Ben Summers. Ben, if you can tell us what we need to know about real strategies to integrate technology into our transportation choices and some of your experiences that you think would be helpful as we continue to refine the concept of complete corridors. Yeah, uh, happy to do that, Colleen, thank you. And uh, Colleen, before I start, since we're on a webinar, I should ask, can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you fine, Ben. Fantastic. All right. Then for the other uh, 200 of you out there, it's uh, great to speak with you uh, this afternoon. Um, I think indeed what, what I hope to do here, I, I appreciated that introduction, Alex, and I think we recognize a lot of the different pieces in there. Um, why don't I start with just a short uh, introduction on, on our perspective here. So uh, I'm an engagement manager with McKinsey and Company. Um, over the last years, I've served a number of different entities from uh, authorities like uh, Sandag to investors who are struggling with questions about the future of mobility. Um, what I'm excited to share with you all today is a broad vision of uh, what the future might look like. We all know that there is uncertainty. And one of the things that we find to be useful is in the face of that uncertainty think, to think about a few scenarios. And then within those scenarios, bring it back to the kinds of things that Alex was talking about as part of complete corridors. Um, for instance, the, the active demand management. For instance, the uh, management of curb space. Um, and I think after this, uh, Jonathan will have the chance to share some more practical, more specifics on that. So if uh, we could go uh, then into the details, I'll, I'll share a couple of slides here. Um, 
why don't we begin uh, with this concept of seamless mobility? And a seamless mobility is what we at McKinsey have started talking about the future. Um, we know that there are many technologies. We know there are many futures. One that we would hope to see um, is one that we call seamless. Um, and this is a future um, which is one in which the boundaries between private, shared, and public transit are blurred. It's places where people have uh, clean, cheap, and flexible ways to get from point A to point B. It's a ideal future where all of this technology brings benefits. Um, what we've done in this piece of work that we'll share here is some thoughts on broadly how to set that direction. We start typically by simply framing the fact that getting around is important. I think to many people on the call, the facts on this slide will be um, obvious. Uh, for those of you, hopefully you can take this into your pocket and use it in the next debate to emphasize the importance of this topic. We know, for example, that cities are going to be a major driver of the economy. That we're looking at 60% of the population by 2030, 65% of the economic growth. Um, this means that in regions like those around San Diego, you are seeing an increasing demand for mobility. Um, it's even more exacerbated in developing cities where the number of passenger kilometers is doubling. Um, and we're also seeing that this means that mobility is vital to our economy. So what we've done is we at some point uh, sat down and said, what would one minute of congestion, one minute of congestion, what does that mean for a city? And for a city, a large developed city like uh, New York or London, a single extra minute of congestion on average adds up to $1.4 billion of, of GDP over the year. So these are the kind of headlines that we use to attract attention to the kinds of concepts we'll talk about today. Um, if, if I pause, the other aspect that we need to highlight is not only mobility important, we also know that it's getting increasingly difficult. Um, and what we've done here is we sat down and ran some examples where we said, what is the impact of an increase in population density, which is the x-axis, on congestion, which is the y-axis? And so take the example of Los Angeles. What you can see is that as Los Angeles became more dense between this, this uh, initial starting point, um, you can see that congestion rose almost 40%. So there's a relation, and I'm sure uh, in, in the San Diego region, I, I know personally I'm a San Francisco native, uh, certainly in San Francisco we are seeing this, we are seeing uh, congestion increase. Um, this is partially because of increased density, as shown here. Um, it is also partially because of increased GDP. It is because of other effects. But what we know is that we are for, we expect congestion to climb. So in order to make sense out of this, we know can, that, that transport's important. We know uh, that there is a challenge. We sat down and painted out three scenarios. Um, and why don't we start with the first one, which is just business as usual. Um, so we took a, a major city about the size of New York or London, 10 million people or so, we created a geospatial model of that city where we could then uh, forecast what a number of, of rational actors would do. And we wound up with the picture something like this. And looking to the future, what you see is you see congestion. Uh, we, were, we, we found an increase of congestion of 15% from the baseline, so 15% more congestion, 15% longer to travel. Um, you can see that things like the bus stops become packed because of the delays. You can see that uh, on the street, uh, deliveries continue to happen, right? And this continues to cause even more congestion. Uh, trains, uh, indeed, are, are packed, but they fill. Um, and fundamentally, we don't see in this business, as usual, a large change to the layout as it is today. So the things that Alex was talking about around um, more active curbs, those aren't in place. Uh, the things that you might see about charging infrastructure, that's not in place. And in a world where this is true, what we see is fundamentally a more congestion. We then took a step back and said, what if you simply did one thing, which was to inject autonomous vehicles? Um, how would this change simply by adding autonomy? We call that a scenario, we call it unconstrained autonomy. Um, so if we take the example of unconstrained autonomy, which is what we are showing here, um, what we saw is that simply by adding these autonomous vehicles to the system, um, to be blunt with you all, it doesn't particularly help. Um, there is some advantage because these autonomous vehicles we know can drive slightly closer together. Uh, right? They are able to communicate possibly with each other and that helps. 
but that is offset but by the phenomenon of induced demand, where we see more individuals uh, taking trips. And we see these individuals choosing, such as this one painted here by the bus stop, choosing to take individual trips in the robo-taxis, individual trips rather than shared trips. Um, what we therefore see is that, again, the fundamental layout of the city does not change. And simply by adding that technology without taking a coordinated approach, um, I would say such as the one uh, that, that Sandag is talking about, without taking a coordinated approach, you do not see a fundamental improvement in the outcome. But there has to be a better scenario, and we call that scenario a seamless mobility. And in order to get there, we did a variety of things. Um, the first is we said, how can we improve the supply of transit? And that's things like what San Diego is talking about with, um, with transit leap. So we said, what if we dramatically improve the performance of rail? And we look at autonomous rail uh, that might move fast. We look at condition-based maintenance, which improves the on-time performance. Um, then we said we also need to think not only about the supply of transit, we also need to think about the demand right? and how do we influence demand and make sure it's at the right time. So this is things like night deliveries. You can see that during the day you're not seeing the trucks on the road. Instead, you see parcel lockers. Um, you could see things such as uh, congestion pricing, right? ways to move demand through time. Um, so this is, this is optimizing demand. Um, and again, I think this, this comes back a bit to the, we had talked, uh, Alex had mentioned the active demand management, that's, that's one of those topics. Uh, and then the third is around sustainability. How do we improve sustainability? And you see this here with the kind of uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure that Alex was talking about. Now, what does this world look like, the seamless mobility world? We find that it improves all five of the indicators that we use to look at a mobility system all five indicators. So in one case, for example, uh, here we look at convenience, we look at availability, we look at efficiency, affordability, and sustainability. These five indicators describe a transit system. And in dark blue, we're showing the baseline. In light blue, we're showing a seamless mobility future. And what we see is a remarkable thing. We see increased availability. So we see a future with 30% more travel. 30% more travel, and yet at the same time, it's 25 to 30% less expensive with 85% fewer emissions. So we're seeing a future that is um, fundamentally by our indicators improved. Now, underlying that, I think for the folks on the call, you'd appreciate the question of what exactly does this look like? And the core answer is it looks like a modal shift away from individual transport and into shared vehicles. Uh, I'm particularly excited because there will be examples, I think, that follow around um, lanes dedicated to shared vehicles. So this is exactly up the alley. What we're showing here is the four scenarios we looked at. We have the baseline. Then remember, we looked at the business as usual urbanization, unconstrained autonomy, where we simply added the autonomous vehicles and seamless mobility. And what we see is we see a shift, and I'll highlight between unconstrained autonomy, where we simply have the autonomous vehicles and seamless mobility. We see a shift here where in unconstrained autonomy, 15% of the passenger kilometers per year are coming from private cars. And we see a shift where many of those individuals and the individuals choosing to be in an individual robo-taxi move over, and they move over into uh, autonomous shuttles, into shared transport. And because of that shared transport, you see a shift from the unconstrained autonomy into the seamless mobility future, where you go from 15% more congestion versus today to 10% less. Now, how do we get there? And I'll pause and, and, and on this. The, the highlighted message is it's a series of coordinated activities on both the regional and the local level, and both the private sector and the public sector. The ones that we identified as the most impactful are shared here. It's around optimizing supply, which we talked about. It's around optimizing demand, which we talked about. And it's around improving sustainability. So thinking about how to step out to this, this future of seamless mobility, um, again, it's these, uh, these sort of three sets of steps that we could see. And what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Jonathan at this point. Um, happy to come back to any questions. What I hope is apparent to the group is as you look at these, you can sense um, that this is very much in line with many of the ideas that are being thought about here uh, around Transit Leap, around mobility hubs, around the next operating system 
and of course uh, around complete corridors. Uh, so thanks very much, and I'll turn it at this point uh, over to Colleen and then Jonathan. Thank you, Ben. You definitely gave us a lot to, to think about, just this whole concept of public and private sector working together, regional and local level, and the opportunity to really build capacity within the existing system. Um, some of those things I had never really even seen before, so I think that's um, really good information for us to be thinking about. I noticed that we've had numerous questions coming in, which is fantastic. And after Jonathan finishes his presentation, then we will dive into the questions. So with that, I'd like to ask Jonathan Hart to tell us about your experience in Illinois and applications that maybe could be considered in the, the San Diego region. Sa thank you, Jonathan. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Colleen. I, I wanted to thank you and, and uh, the Sandag affiliate partners for, for having us speak with you and for including us. Uh, wanted to uh, thank Ben for, for, for laying out these, these possible futures for us. Uh, I, I think what Ben has done is done an excellent job of explaining why it's so critical to engage in this type of holistic forward-thinking planning at this time. He's presented us with just three of what I'm sure are many uh, conceivable scenarios of what the future might look like. The difficult thing is that any one of those is possible. So how at a time when we're looking forward and not necessarily seeing which way that road diverges, how can we plan for that? How can we uh, exercise our resources in an efficient way where, where we won't have to go back and, and correct uh, perhaps errors of the past? Um, specifically, uh, your Big Five Moves does an excellent job of recognizing some of these primary challenges that we are facing. And they're not just at a regional level, but, but the nation at large. Um, with the central theme really coming back to the fact that we cannot build our way out of congestion or we can't continue to try to build our way of, out of congestion. And we're approaching the limits of what we can do with traditional capital programs. Um, again, this is why it's so critical for us to, to engage in a holistic planning process that recognizes the interconnectivity between modes of transportation and embracing uh, future technologies. Just to give you a little bit of context here uh, in the region that, that, that I'll be talking to you about, um, the, uh, the Illinois Tollway uh, covers uh, 12 counties, uh, over 294 centerline miles. Um, as Ben was talking about, the, the percentage of population that, that will gravitate towards cities in the metro region, we're already looking at 70% of the statewide population. In, in in these 12 counties and much of that is is in uh, is in Cook County and what we refer to as the collar counties um, what we set out to do was to develop and implement a plan that provided for our region's current needs but to do so while maintaining flexibility to embrace change as this paradigm evolves um, not only are we dealing with a large population, over a large geographic area, but we're dealing with dense urban communities, suburban communities, and even some rural areas, all of them with unique transportation needs uh, and, 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 and different, uh, different priorities. Uh, it's not dissimilar to, to the Sandag region. And again, the similarity, no, oh, I'd like to go back. I'm gonna need some help going back because I'm unfortunately only able to go forward. I apologize. All right, well, I shall soldier on. Specifically, the challenges that we are that 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 we were facing were increased demand, um, diminishing resources to meet that demand, as uh, many of you are familiar. And, and the goals are are certainly not specific to 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 our region. Uh, the desire to improve mobility, the desire to relieve congestion, to enhance safety, and to accommodate change. And again, the solutions that we had available to us um, are 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 not unique. Um, we have the traditional uh, traditional solutions of rehabilitation and reconstructing, uh, maintaining our system in a state of good repair. Uh, widening and even new facilities are always an option, um, but also the desire to better incorporate transit with highway corridors and to address emerging technologies and embrace emerging, uh, emerging solutions. So 
we of course were able to move forward with uh, some of these traditional programs, um, a, a new facility, which, which was something of, of a luxury uh, in a region where we had the opportunity to do that. Um, but uh, adding capacity uh, to our existing facilities through additional lanes, uh, enhancing interchanges and, and, and again, rebuilding some of our critical infrastructure to ensure that it remains in a state of, of good repair. Um, this plan needed to certainly rebuild and maintain what we have, uh, but it also needed to make sure that it was going to carry us well into the future. Again, we come back to this idea of we can't build our way out of congestion. And I, I would say that this is not an attempt to build our way out of congestion, but recognition that we have these opportunities, we need to take them now. But if we take these opportunities, we need to do so in such a way that is going to leave us flexible and with the ability to, to take advantage of these uh, in a way that will serve us later on. So I think that planning in this transitional period um, is really well, very, very well exemplified by uh, the, the I-90 Smart Road project that we, we undertook. Um, as you saw in previous picture, there, there was a widening here. And the question from that point became, what do we do now that we've widened? How do we make sure that we're not simply putting down pavement and, and hoping that it resolves the problem? And there were a lot of options available to us. Um, obviously, our, our, our near-term goal was for immediate relief to congestion uh, through additional capacity. Um, but beyond that, there was a desire to accommodate transit, uh, much, like, much like Alex brought up earlier. Um, and to, to look at these, these flexible options, um, active traffic management was, was considered managed lanes, um, the peak hour shoulder running to expand capacity, even heavy rail were all considered at one point. And the goal at that point really wasn't to decide which one of these futures was, was, was the future. Uh, the solution that we needed to, to reach was a solution that didn't prevent any of these options from being enacted in the future. So how do we leave the door open to these uncertain futures? So just quickly, uh, the I-90 Smart Road Corridor concept uh, was, was simply uh, active traffic management uh, through overhead lane control signs, as you see here. Uh, Dynamic message signs, uh, unfortunately, you can't see it so well in this one, but every half mile, uh, those dynamic message signs gave us the ability to communicate with drivers uh, in a manner and frequency approaching that of, uh, of the, the uh, connected vehicle technology. Um, uh, most importantly, the inclusion of power, uh, fiber optic communication cable uh, throughout the corridor along with, with equipment shelters. Um, provided us a, a really flexible corridor. And because these assets were already in place, new technology can be implemented quickly, inexpensively, and, and without disrupting the pavement or impediment to traffic. It's effectively a plug and play environment. So what we're looking at here is what daily operations look like today along the I-90 corridor. Uh, as you can see, under normal operating conditions, uh, we have provided space for our pace suburban bus service. Um, the, the BRT service that's provided is supported by park and ride facilities with direct access to I-90, and it allows PACE to offer not just transit, but transit that's more attractive to, to, uh, to, to motorists. Uh, and in a place where motorists can't observe, uh, this PACE bus moving through traffic at a speed that is greater than, than that of traffic. Um, that it, it's just a, there's no better advertisement than being passed by a bus. Uh, if you're running a bus service, that is. Uh, and lastly, it provided a level of uh, stability and predictability in travel times along the corridor and allowed PACE to execute a number of, of new BRT routes. So again, this is what it looks like on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with the PACE Express bus in the flex lane. Uh, but when needed, the flex lane can be closed to accommodate incidents. Uh, it keeps motorists and first responders safe. You can see here that the overhead lane control signals keep motorists away from the incident while providing sufficient information uh, and inform drivers with positive instruction. Uh, tend to be orderly drivers and, and use the road in an efficient manner. Um, 
this is an existing technology. You've, you've likely seen this in place, but we thought long and hard about the actual implementation and how this technology would be used, and we're using it in a very different, much more active and frequent manner. More importantly, these lanes uh, are not dedicated to anything. This can be operated as an HOV lane. It can be operated a, as a high occupancy toll lane. It can be used for freight only or electric vehicles only. Um, the flexibility there is, is really substantial and, and part of what we were going for. Um, one of the things that, that the continuous access to power and communications and equipment cabinets does for us is provides us with these virtually unlimited possibilities. We recently flipped the switch on the state's first uh, connected vehicle test bed simply by deploying the necessary radio equipment. This was done in a matter of weeks at a very low cost, and it allowed the Illinois Tollway to experience, operate, and evaluate the technology well in advance of a full deployment. So rather than spending thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars with a large scale deployment, these were simply, again, uh, pretty close to plug and play. Um, this also mitigates the risk associated with evaluating new technology by allowing for rapid piloting on a small scale and, and to con conduct that evaluation. Um, eventually, uh, those overhead gantries with the lane control signals may no longer be necessary as we move towards a fully connected fleet. We're ready for that as well. Uh, beyond that, uh, we can get pretty out there. Uh, we can look at um, contactless in-lane charging, uh, which would offer lower costs and greater efficiencies, allowing electric vehicles to travel greater distances, uh, making uh, electric power a viable alternative for the commercial trucking industry, um, providing really tremendous efficiencies uh, and allowing electric power to be, to be a much more viable option for everybody. By having that power in place, We've really lowered the barriers to, to, to entry here, the financial barriers to testing and adopting new tech uh, in that there's, there's no trenching, there's no digging up the road. Ultimately, what uh, Smart Road offers is, is a bridge between today's needs and the technologies that we have on hand while creating an environment where advanced technologies can be adopted as the technology and as our, our needs as, as a region evolve. And I'd just like to close with uh, some, some brief lessons learned. Uh, people like Ben do an outstanding job of helping us envision a range of possible futures. Uh, it should be our goal to, to look at that range and ensure that we remain cognizant of those possibilities and seek out solutions that create rather than limit our, our options. Um, flexibility is not something that we use uh, 20 years or ten, on a 10 year planning horizon. Flexibility is something that we use to manage an incident uh, now. Uh, it's opening up a shoulder when traffic is particularly heavy. Um, we want that flexibility not to serve us in the long run as a hedge, but something that can serve us today. I think one of the most important things to do is to communicate and socialize that vision. Uh, flexibility costs more. Uh, it can be expensive and the payoff can be difficult to quantify and, and explain to others. To help under, people understand why an investment in flexibility is, is fiscally wise and, and prudent uh, and will save you tremendous costs uh, for, further down. And lastly, don't don't shy away from I don't know. Uh, again, for as wonderful a job as folks like Ben do showing us these possibilities, we don't know which of these futures we're going to see. So just remain flexible, remain prepared, uh, and try to identify opportunities for flexible solutions. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Ben, hand it back to Colleen, and uh, get to some questions. Great, thank you, Jonathan. You also gave us a lot to uh, think about. We have multiple questions that have have come in, and um, I think where we're going to start here, there seem to be several questions around just sort of human behavior, willingness to change, and and really how this region could move toward a seamless transportation system. So, you know, I'll start that with with you, Ben. Just the the human behavior and and willingness to change. We're seeing a lot of that coming up in the questions. What what ideas do you have there for us? Uh, it's an interesting one. Um, I think there's two, so a couple of reflections I think that we've seen over the years. There's a fantastic chart that's produced every year of the fraction of business uh, receipts 
that are uh, taken by uh, taxis, that are uh, by e-hailing, so Lyft and Uber uh, and their competitors, and then uh, also by rental cars. And when we first started tracking this in some detail uh, at McKinsey, we saw that uh, e-hailing was really just starting to take a small percentage. And we had showed this to a number of our clients who are considering large investments in uh, things like rental car facilities. And they said, well, it's still a small part of the market. And only two years later, uh, Lyft and Uber have substantially consumed uh, that portion of the market. So I think what we're seeing with technology is an unprecedented uh, speed of change and an a, a very different mindset of the uh, user of the transportation uh, in the transportation network. Um, the other two examples that, that do pop up, it's not just e-hailing. Uh, we see this in uptake of shared bicycles. We see this in uptake of the last mile mobility, um, micro mobility like scooters, which I believe last year in the U.S. surpassed, uh, surpassed bike share already. So what we're seeing is an unprecedented willingness to change. So that's really helpful. And I wonder, Jonathan, do you have any thoughts on this as well in your experience? Well, I think Ben's done an excellent job, and specifically with with the example of of Uber and Lyft and ride hailing in general. Um, it, it's a very complex question. Changing behavior is is there are a lot of tools that we have available to us. Pricing being one of them. Um, but I, I think that the carrot is frequently more effective than the stick, and we simply need to offer people a better alternative. Uh, ride hailing was a better alternative to, to, to taxis. In many cases, ride hailing was a better alternative to a single occupancy uh, vehicle trip. So, so by offering things that are compelling and provide people with options that, that are actually attractive, um, we, we, we can change that behavior. And I, I think that there are many opportunities to, to, to do that. We, we simply need to um, maybe sometimes think more like marketers and less like, like planners and engineers. Okay, thank you for that. Um, back to Ben, we've had some questions about active transportation, biking and walking, and I think we talked a lot about the, the vehicles and, and infrastructure. Could you expand a little bit on bike and, and ped improvements as we're thinking about this in terms of complete corridors? Yeah, gladly. I, I should start by maybe caveating this by saying I'm a proud member of the San Francisco Bike Coalition, uh, which has done some fantastic work in the last few uh, months, just personally, uh, I, I believe. Um, so <laughs> you'll get a professional opinion and a uh, personal enthusiasm here. Um, I, I, Jonathan, I love what you say about how the carrot is more important. So I think there's two roles that you could see for active transit. Um, one is the uh, role that is for me as a bicycle enthusiast, um, it remains a form of transit. Um, in the model that we shared, it, it, we looked at about 5%. Um, we do see that climbing in a number of cities, London included, New York included, um, San Francisco included. So we do see that as a, just a form of transit that's valid. I think the other key role for this active transit is around the last mile. And um, one of the most powerful carrots that we found in the work that we were doing is that by offering better last mile options, which does include bike share, by offering better last mile options, you make transit more compelling. So there's at least a second and maybe more important role for uh, bikes uh, and for pedestrians, which is around acting as a carrot and encouraging people to move on to transit by making that last mile more convenient. Okay, great. That's really helpful. We had a um, a few questions just on kind of some definitions here, and one of them is, what is smart parking? Would one of you want to respond and, and give a definition of smart parking? Yeah, there's uh, the way that we included it in our thinking um, is that this is a system that signals to drivers, uh, whether autonomous or human, that signals to drivers wh where the location of uh, parking spots are. And the way this was expressed in our forecasting is that this reduces the fraction of vehicles that at any time are circulating to find parking. Uh, in the taxi and e-hailing world, they call this deadheading time, where you have vehicles driving around with no passengers. 
So what we did is we said there's a system in there and you can make some intelligent assumptions about the fraction of deadheading time that it reduces. Um, I'd be interested because I know um, on the parking point, I know that um, man, uh, uh, more active curbs is one of the points that Alex is looking at uh, as part of um, as part of complete corridors. Alex, I don't know if you have particularly more to add on the more active uh, curbs point. No, that, that was a great explanation, Ben. Um, and, but we are definitely considering it as part of the complete corridor. Yeah, and we have another um, question. I think this one is is a good one for Jonathan. Congestion pricing, who pays and how is that implemented? So it's a great question and how is it implemented is going to depend on, on where you are. I mean, who, who pays? It's, it's clearly the motorist. I think the more interesting question, um, if I can, is who benefits? Um, and people tend not to see that. You'll hear the, the, the term, you know, Lexus lane thrown around. The fact of the matter is, is that um, those lanes are, are filled with uh, more Toyotas, Hondas, and, and Chevys than, than anything else. Um, and they're used by people who need to get some there, somewhere uh, quickly for whatever reason, uh, whether it's in, uh, a trip to the airport or, or to daycare. Um, they're there for, for use when you need them. More importantly, for every vehicle that's in your managed lane, that's a vehicle that's not in your general purpose lane. So um, that's just a little pitch, I guess, for, for my own personal preference for, um, for managed lanes. Um, um, specifically in terms of um, uh, pricing based on the level of congestion, I'm assuming we're talking about congestion pricing in terms, in terms of pricing as a, as a result of traffic volume as opposed to coordinate pricing like, like you, you see in, in, in London. Um, but um, getting back to the question who pays, um, the users pay and I think that's the beauty of it because um, right now we have a system where, where you, um, you, you pay regardless uh, of whether or not you're using a particular facility. Um, this, this really relegates uh, the, the financial responsibility to, to the people who are, are making use of it and, and providing a closer link between uh, your use of something and, and the payment. And I, again, providing that, 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 cog that, that, that mental link between I'm using something and I'm paying for it, I, I believe really helps us uh, convey and, and, and keep up uh, a, a solid argument for why people do need to pay for these things. I hope that I wasn't completely off the mark on, on the question there. I, I think it's a really complicated question and, and definitely something that we have to probably spend more time thinking about. There was another question that came up a couple of times related to your um, slides, Ben, and that was seeing um, autonomous vehicles replacing buses over time. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, happy to do it. And it might actually be worth stepping back. Let me see, because uh, we're looking then at the modal at the modal shift um, chart. But uh, fundamentally, what we see um, is if you make certain assumptions around the pricing of uh, autonomous vehicles, um, they are both more convenient and conceivably less expensive than um, buses. For example, the bulk of the operating cost for mo most public transit, um, as well as taxis, is the human driver. It's, it's in the neighborhood of 80% of the operating cost. Um, if you can assume that you get autonomous vehicles down to a reasonable cost point, um, they become extremely compelling, um, and you see individuals opting for them. The other reason they opt is not just the, the pricing, it's also a convenience factor. You uh, can estimate that they are able to do point-to-point -point trips. Now, the, the challenge with that is that you need people to be opting into shared modes. That is one of the key aspects of seamless mobility is encouraging sharing. And what we see in this unconstrained autonomy scenario is that the individuals opt for individual autonomous transit, and that indeed replaces a lot of the bus uh, traffic. And that has the, the, the outcome of increasing congestion. So the key is, if we do believe that there is going to be a, a dramatic change from autonomous transit, then we need to think about what are the public interventions, what are the private interventions, to make sure that users, when they choose an autonomous mode, choose a shared autonomous mode. Yeah, excellent points there with the, the shared aspect. 
it looks like we have time for about one more question. We've had several questions come in around um, ensuring that all users have equal access to the system, including low income, limited mobility, you know, just the, the social equity aspect of the transportation system. And I, it'd be great, um, Ben and Jonathan, if each of you could, you know, just kind of highlight a few thoughts on how to address that question, and then we will wrap up. So do you want to start, Ben? Yeah, happy to. Um, yeah, gosh, I think it's, um, it's fundamentally, it's one of the tricky things is you see a number of private actors increasingly providing a service that at least in the last 50 to uh, 50 to 100 years has been significantly provided by a government. And the challenge then becomes, if that is so, then how can regulations keep up to make sure that everyone has enough access and that the pricing is reasonable? And you're seeing really interesting, I think, first steps of this in the scooter pilots, right, where cities are requiring that scooters are deployed in low-income areas. Um, you see this as well in some of the regulations around the taxi network companies at a California level where there are requirements about um, making sure that there's access uh, to, to disabled folks, that those companies provide that kind of access, that they provide it in an even way. Um, and then there's, of course, questions around the, the cost side, um, where you see uh, concerns around, for example, the surge pricing that the e-hailing companies did. Um, so I think the, the principal insight that I would share is that this is a real concern, and it's a concern driven by what we're seeing, which is fast changes in a historically relatively regulated and public sector um, sector of, of our country. And then Jonathan, any thoughts from you on this question? Yeah, absolutely, and I'm, I'm, I'm really glad the question is asked. Um, I, I understand, I think, why the question was asked. Um, I, I do personally believe that mobility is, is a human right. The ability to provide for yourself uh, for your dependence is is it's entirely dependent on on mobility. Um, so so we need to make sure that when we are building these transportation systems of tomorrow, that that it's everybody's tomorrow and not not just some people's tomorrow. Um, it, it tolling inherently has has a it has a, a, a an environmental justice uh, um, conundrum. Let's say I, there are many ways to deal with it, and um, I, I don't want to take up the rest of the time pontificating on on that. I do think that it's something that can be mitigated, um, but I, but also the inclusion of um, of BRT um, on the I-90 corridor, I, I believe, is an excellent example where where what they have effectively done is they've opened up not just access but all of the benefits of that facility. Uh, to non-toll payers, uh, and, and they're able to, to enjoy reliable travel times. They're able to enjoy, in some cases, benefits that paying, um, paying motorists are not able to enjoy. Um, so there are options by thinking about these things holistically that we're not just ensuring a, a, a balanced mode share, but we're, we're, ensuring, um, we're ensuring access for everybody. And I, that, that, that's one of the most critical things that I think we should all keep in mind as decision makers, planners, whatever our profession. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And I really want to thank you both, Jonathan and, and Ben, for participating with us. Um, there were multiple questions that came in. We could not get to all of them, but we will be putting together uh, frequently asked questions and, and posting those to the Sandag website. So we really appreciate all of you who were able to join us today. I know that I learned a lot from the experts. I know Alex did as well. And we have a number of Sandag staff that are also in another room listening in. And I, I look forward to hearing their thoughts on how um, this can help us refine our thinking on complete corridors. This um, webinar is being uh, recorded and it will be available online by Friday. Those of you who registered, we will be sending you an email and letting it know once it's posted, it'll be posted in both English and in Spanish. And we hope you will come back and join us for future webinars as we dig into the details on the five big moves and, and really work on refining and shaping this vision for the San Diego region's future. Uh, we've listed a number of ways that you can also connect 
with us, so please do that. And finally, in your webinar control screen, you will see a row labeled handouts where you can download items and overview brochure about the five big moves and a flyer featuring key elements of complete corridors. So thank you all and have a great day.